you are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about positive solutions to environmental challenges. Solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics of earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe? How to plant a food forest? Restorative design or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned for Sustainable World Radio. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier. My guest today is Dr. John Todd, the inventor of eco-machines and a pioneer in ecological design. John Todd is the president of Ocean Arcs International and the founder and president of John Todd Ecological Design, Inc. John has won numerous awards, including Time Magazine's Hero of the Planet, the United Nations Award for Contributions to the Global Environment, and the Buckminster Fuller Challenge. Welcome to Sustainable World Radio, Dr. John Todd. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm thrilled that you're here. And um, John, let's just start off for those listeners who may not know, you've been an ecological designer for decades. And for people who are wondering, what is an ecological design? What is ecological design? Can you explain that to our listeners? Yeah, I think in the in very simplest terms, uh, let me give you a little bit of background. Um, we, as ecological designers, look to our operating instructions for the design of many different kinds of technologies. We look to the natural world. We look to the story uh, of nature evolving, of its past three plus billion years of interacting, different life forms interacting with each other. And out of that story comes kind of a language which we use to design what we call living technologies. And uh, so it's really following nature's operating instructions to use a term that uh, uh, Buckminster Fuller liked to use. And uh, so when we engineer something, because we're engineers, we're designers, we're applied ecologists, um, we always work with complex nature. And so if I'm designing for you a machine to grow foods, it will be a little ecology whose byproducts are foods. If I'm designing for you a sewage treatment system, it will be another kind of ecology, which allows us to transform sewage into pure water that after sterilization can be reused in many different ways. And, or if I'm trying to designed for you a technology that generates fuels as a byproduct, then I have in my tool bag, if you will, a living systems that can accomplish that task for me. And then finally, on the biggest scale of all, if one is trying to heal or repair Um, a damaged environment, an estuary, a salt pond, a lake, a stream, then we also have uh, these larger, more comprehensive technologies, which are basically designed to heal whole environments, including even possibly the inshore oceans, which is an area that we're working right now. So it's all about working with complex life forms mechanically, relatively simply, and it's putting your trust that nature knows how to solve problems that we humans are only just beginning to understand. Mm -hmm. And so, um, John, when did you realize that you wanted to move in this direction of working with nature and learning from nature and not just go straight into um, more (laughs) of a mainstream (laughs) mainstream Mainstream. field of study? I'm, I'm, I hope I don't discourage too many of your listeners. I certainly, from an educational point of view, I thought, aha, I should learn about agriculture. So I t- 
took a degree in agriculture. And then I found that it wasn't the kind of universe I wanted to occupy. It was all chemicals and control management. And so I went into an ecological field that include tropical medicine and parasitology. And I began to realize that I was entering a whole new domain of understanding how the world works. And then continuing on, you'd think I'd want to take a break from <laughs> education. I then studied uh, fisheries and oceanography and animal behavior for my doctorate. But all of that was just walking around a circle of knowledge because I didn't know, I didn't have a roadmap. I was just going to various places in the circle to ga gather this information. But what preceded all of that was when I was a boy, um, we lived in an area that had quite a bit of wildness and naturalness. And in a matter of a few years, it was destroyed to make way for corporations and subdivisions. And so I became, my world crumbled around me as a child. And my father, bless him, found me a series of books by the American novelist, Louis Bromfield. And these books were all about a place, a place which for me became magical in Ohio called Malabar Farm. And he told the story of coming back just before World War II, looking at all of his childhood landscape, having seen it ravaged, deforested, badly managed, streams gone, springs disappearing, had set out to restore this place. Mm. And so his five or six books, and I was only 13 when I started reading these, he basically was saying to this little kid, me, um, what has been destroyed can be healed. And here's how I did it. And I was goofy with joy that there was an alternative to destruction. And I bet today, um, anybody starting out, this was a long time ago that I read those, would probably get the same level of excitement from exactly those books, um, the Malabar Farm series that I read so, so long ago. And that really set me down the path. And, uh, and uh, so, and of course, a lot of his knowledge came from observing uh, peasant farmers in, in France and other parts of Europe where he lived until the outbreak of the war. And so his knowledge came from um, a very traditional kind of agriculture. But he was also an innovator, a great innovator. That's beautiful. And so you actually, um, I did a lot of research about you in the past month, and you really, it seems like your life work, you're, you go into the places that people typically avoid. <laughs> And so you're going into wastewater, you're helping transform wastewater treatment plants into these oases. Um, you go to degraded, industrial, polluted, toxic water and help heal this water. So can you share with our listeners some of the projects that you have worked on? And I would especially love to hear about the Omega Institute and Grafton. So if you could just give us an idea, maybe pick one of those and then tell us a bit about how you transform these areas. Why don't I start with Grafton? Grafton is a little town along the Blackstone River corridor, which extends from Worcester in Massachusetts to Providence in Rhode Island. And it's the part of the country where um, the Industrial Revolution began. It was along the Blackstone River. And in the early days of the Industrial Revolution, every mile along the river, a dam was built and a mill or factory was created. And the, the dam created the energy to operate the machines that ran the mills. And then just uphill from them, but parallel 
canals were dug all the way from Worcester to Providence so that barges in the early days pulled by horses um, could carry goods up and down the corridor. So the river powered the mills and the canals provided the transportation network. And then in the around 1900, in the early years of the 20th century, um, these mills began to convert away from water power to engines and machines that were run by uh, oil, a very dense oil called bunker crude oil. They then uh, built great big concrete or cement tanks in the ground and filled these tanks up with the oil to power. After the Second World War, the factories all in rather rapid succession shut down. And uh, the, the work that they did was, of course, as we all know, exported overseas because it could be built cheaper. And so these big tanks in the ground, in many cases, were filled with tens of thousands of gallons of crude oil that had never been used. And the tanks began to crack and break, and oil was spilling out into the environment at an uncontrollable and an unimaginable, unmanageable rate. And so a lot of damage was done to the, to the wildlife in the canals and also probably to the river, although I have less concrete evidence there. I do have some. So what we did, we were brought in by a very far-sighted man who was wanting to um, kind of redevelop a green center, a uh, green enterprise. He didn't quite know what that meant at the time. And so he asked us if we could create technologies that would clean up the oil in the canals. He'd been dredging and it wasn't working and it was costing millions of dollars. It was not a cost-effective solution. So we set out to create, we actually built a facility um, in the town of Grafton on the side of the canal in which we had four connected living technologies. The first one was on the bottom of the canal and we called it a, a sediment digester. And then the second one was a series of technologies, two anyway, inside a greenhouse on the edge of the canal. And in the greenhouse, the first thing we did was cultivate many different kinds of wood rot fungi or wood rot mushrooms. And then we took the contaminated water as the second stage of the treatment and sprinkled it over these, these uh, mushrooms. And then the water flowed into a technology that we called an eco-machine. And it, it was housed inside great big giant aquaria inside this greenhouse. And inside these tanks were literally thousands of species of organisms from all of the kingdoms of life. So our theory was that life in concert can solve problems. Life alone, meaning an individual species, rarely can solve a true problem. So the water then flowed through these tanks, there were six of them, and then back out into the canal where they were spread, the water was then spread with the sprinkler system over a floating technology which looked like a long, skinny, but with some undulating shapes, raft. And into the raft were all of these marsh plants that had been planted. Um, holes were cut into the raft and they were placed in there. So it looked like a little floating, living uh, garden on a raft in the stream. And as the water circulated round and round and round, and we didn't know what would exactly happen, the oil that was in the water that came in when it left the greenhouse had been reduced by over 95%. Mm. And it was, just, 
it was just remarkable. And of course, this process goes on day in and day out, even year round, although of course it's slower in the winter time. But but it it worked. And then and and at that time the EPA was supporting it. And we had really good technical support from uh, Brown University's uh, Superfund Chemistry Lab. And we could see all this happening. And then after the the money, the, the, the program ended, we decided we would keep this eco-machine complex going. And over the years, we started to watch the life come back into the canal and frogs starting, I guess it was last year. Yeah, last year, maybe the year before, but I think it was last year, started to breed and their populations were growing and they're kind of the canaries in the ecological mine. If there's pollution around, they're not. So, and then we began to see how the canal itself, the ugly oil slick, had uh, had mostly disappeared, and uh, and it was like downstream, the the canal was waking up, and uh, and so it, it was at that point that we became optimistic enough to imagine a corridor, the, the almost 80 miles from Worcester to Providence, where the canals would have down their middle a floating park that people could walk or ride a bike and go between the two cities while watching the water being cleaned up. Now that big project hasn't happened, but I have a feeling that one day it'll get bigger and longer and longer and eventually it will happen. And so when I, when we see these horrible oil spills, and they really are horrible, and hopefully there'll be fewer in the future, at least now we can say to ourselves, there are ways of healing these places that have been so badly damaged by oil. And, uh, and you know, these kinds of things could be in busy harbors where ships are spilling oil all the time when they're refueling and pumping their bilges and, you know, all the things that happen in big harbors. So one can, one can begin to look at variations on this theme being applied around the world. When someone asks you to clean up this degraded oil a spill that's been going on for, for ages, I guess my que- I guess my question is how did you come to the place where you thought I can do this and that how did you get the idea to use nature as the operating manual for your project or projects in general there is one specific instance that brought all the bits and pieces together in the and this goes back away in um 1986 which is a long time ago most people's lives anyway. Um, I came across, I was at a landfill here on Cape Cod. At that landfill, I was taken to a waste lagoon where the town was dumping various kinds of waste, septic tank waste, waste from various facilities, uh, you know, like rest homes, etc. cetera. And uh, it, was in a, it was in a dug lagoon so I had that lagoon water analyzed, and in it were all of the toxic pollutants that the United States Environmental Protection Agency were most concerned about in terms of water contamination. It was just awful. I looked down into that pond and realized that that lagoon had no liner and was dug into coarse sand. And that lagoon was only a few feet above the drinking water table of the town. And I realized that that community, like so many others around the world, was poisoning itself. Now, an unlined lagoon, at least in Massachusetts, is no longer legal, but it was then. So... I inquired, why is it that this stuff can't be fixed up with conventional wastewater treatment? 
And I was told that it's too concentrated, it's too toxic, it, uh, wastewater treatment plant operators don't like to, to add significant amounts of it to their systems for all these reasons. And it's too expensive that communities just couldn't afford it. So I said, I want to design a eco-machine that mimics the genius of nature. And so I basically set out and said, the first thing I want to do is to make sure that this is powered by sunshine. Because almost all life evolved under the power of sunshine. So this technology that I'm creating had 21 huge aquaria, all connected like beads on a string so that the water could flow from one tank to the other tank all the way down the line. There were 21 of them. And the sides of these tanks allowed for upward of 80% of sunlight to enter the sides as well as the top. So they were really a solar ecology. And then inside the tanks, um, I added uh, life from, and I kid you not, a dozen wild environments, from salt marshes to streams to ponds to wet spots and woods to pig wallows from a farm. Everywhere I went with my bucket and collecting stuff. It wasn't very sophisticated. <laughs> was this the turkey baster? The turkey baster was <laughs> right along there. And, uh, and that, um, that allowed for the, the, um, this amazing uh, ecology to form. And then once it began, and oh, the other thing that I should mention is that while there were also many different kinds of parent ecosystems, in this case, about a dozen, there were also, I made sure that all of the kingdoms of life were represented. This just wasn't a bacteria thing, or this just wasn't an algal solution. We had plants and animals and fungi and protozoans and you name it. They were all, they were all had representatives in the system. Then I began to pump the pollution from that lagoon that I told you about into the tanks. And each tank was a little different than the next one downstream because life inside them was adjusting itself to the strength and the type of waste at each stage. So I ended up having um, over 20 miniature treatment systems, each uniquely adapted to the to the composition of the waste at that stage as it went down. It was a 10 day journey for the water to go from being extremely foul and toxic to being uh, very clean. And so um, that really all of the design ideas that coalesced, coalesced in that very early system. And I've been working on variations of that theme ever since. And the, the great biologist, Lynn Margulis, um, the late Lynn Margulis, she and her students at the Marine Biological Laboratory here in Woods Hole um, came down to study the life in these tanks. And what they found was that they did recognize the life forms, but the communities inside the tanks they'd never seen. In other words, these were new communities on the face of the earth, even though the various residents were knowable and recognizable species. So it, uh, the self-designed, self-organizational power in nature was revealed to me really early on via that experiment. That, that's incredible. What a story. So, so you're mimicking how nature purifies water and land. And we're also, we're also not only mimicking, we're increasing the rates. For example, on the surface of those tanks, I made a raft, a little raft, and planted higher plants, shrubs, 
and, uh, and perennials and even a few annuals. And their roots grew down into the water and the water was circulated with, with uh, compressed air. So it is being bumping up against the roots of these plants all the time and the life on the roots. And so it's, it's a much higher rate of exchange and interaction than would occur in nature normally. So what we're doing is basically speeding up this process by the movement of water in, uh, in multiple dimensions. So water movement is always a big factor for us. It makes me really feel hopeful that humans can, that we can have a beneficial impact if we work hand in hand with biology. I think you're absolutely right. There's no question that the, that, that there is reason to, reason for hope. Um, and the, there's even reason for hope, which I'm sure you've covered in, in, with other people, with the idea that we can, as part of our dealing with the landscape can carbon farm and take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and to put it into soils and, uh, and beneficial things. So it's the same kinds of processes in carbon farming that I do in the water, really. It's trying to reduce the amount of nutrients and manage and transform them into, into, um, into beneficial forms, and in some cases, commercial forms. So some of the byproducts of these eco-machines are in fact commercial byproducts. And, uh, and one day we'll get even better at making commercial byproducts, living things out of our transformation process. Turning waste into some, into value. Right. And you know, the, uh, I've just been thinking lately, the, um, there's been this this concern, and rightly in, in California, of, of a fairly significant earthquake. And I think what most people don't realize is in a situation like that, probably the first things to get disrupted would be the, the water supply and the sewage works, because these are all pipes that are kind of prone to, to bu buckling and busting. And you know, it may be time, and maybe it should start in California, for people to uh, to begin to think of wastewater transformation at source. In other words, close the loop at source and reuse the water more extensively so that we can avoid any disruptions that might occur with these long extended linear networks that we've created with freshwater and sewage. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we do have experience uh, doing that sort of thing, not in California, I might add, uh, but um, at the Omega Institute, which is uh, a, a educational facility north of New York City, there is a, a building it's it's called the the uh, center for sustainable living I probably borrowed the name from you yeah. <laughs> uh, the uh, that in fact treats all the sewage of the campus which is about 60,000 gallons a day at peak um and reuses it to a large degree on site and um what their, their basic attitude was to adopt a new standard, which was called the Living Building Standard. The Living Building Challenge, it was called, I should say. It was created by architects. And the idea is a building is a net positive from a carbon point of view. In other words, it generates a little bit more electricity than it uses. It removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere more than it puts out into the atmosphere. And, uh, and the structure we created was an educational building, but inside it was the eco-machine for the treating of the sewage and the reusing of that water. And so there are precedent 
for beginning to close the loop with our water cycles. Um, I think this could be a very important one for conserving water and, uh, and for protecting uh, water supplies and water use from disruption. And it's, it's the, the Omega system. If you uh, go to the Omega website, um, the, you can see the pictures of the facility. It's beautiful. I mean, it's right where the sewage is being treated that the yoga class is doing. I know. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what struck me. I've never, I've been to the wastewater treatment plant here. You would yeah. not want to do any deep breathing exercises. <laughs> I not want to do any deep breathing exercise. That's another reason why we put the plants on the surface. If you go to a conventional sewage treatment plant, there are all these tiny water droplets with pathogens in them blowing out in the wind. So with the plants on the tops of our tanks, those water droplets stay in the tanks. So they're not blowing around, um, perhaps creating uh, health hazards. And I, I do believe, um, and you can tell us more about this, that eco machines very effectively remove some of the more insidious and hard to filter out contaminants. Talking about these um, these chemicals that uh, are called endocrine disruptors. Exactly. Yes, and antibiotics, pharmaceuticals. How how is biology effect, or is biology more effective at removing those than we are? Uh, well, it it was thought until recently that that the conventional sewage treatment plants don't seem to do a very good job with them, but we found at um, we found at the Omega facility there was a, a, a the Cary Institute decided to see the, these are people who study cancer uh, causing uh, compounds decided to see if our ego machine was removing these gender bender or endocrine disrupting uh, chemicals from the water and they found that and these are the kind of pills that we all take in varying forms and varying shapes. And it was found that the the vast majority, maybe 80% anyway, of these chemicals were disappearing, were, had disappeared by the time the water left the eco machine. And, uh, and, you know, things like ibuprofen and stuff like that. And that's really quite remarkable because the U.S. Geological Survey has discovered these chemicals um, in reservoirs, in streams, in lakes. They're everywhere now. They've just simply gone down the toilets and out into the world, and now they're ubiquitous. And so here's a chance to get rid of most, if not all of them. And uh, I, th I think that's very, very encouraging. Um, you know, it really, really does say that we're on the verge of, of being able to design and ecologically engineer technologies to, to handle that problem. So it's very exciting. And it was at Omega that the, this was first demonstrated. And hearing about the success of these projects, it really made me think about fracking wastewater and possibly nuclear waste. Could you envision um, eco machines helping to clean up those environmental messes that we've made? Honestly, don't know about nuclear waste. I haven't, you know, I've been, <laughs> I've been along with my wife, uh, uh, you know, an anti-nuclear activist most of my life, so I have not really paid attention. But when it comes to, uh, to fracking, there are, there are a lot of different chemicals, and fracking water has, is, varies very widely. But at, in my lab at the University of Vermont a few years ago with uh, uh, a wonderful, at the time, doctoral student, Anthony McGinnis, uh, we knew there was a chemical that was used rather ubiquitously and in high volumes throughout the mining industry uh, to uh, try and improve the quality of the saleable product. And it, it's, it's a group of chemicals that I can't even pronounce. It's alcanolamine, alcanolamine, 
And uh, there was one particular one with an impossible name abbreviated to A-E-E-A. And it was known to be contaminating groundwater. And from the literature, it didn't seem to be biodegradable. So we set out to create a small lab laboratory scale eco machine in a greenhouse because it required sunlight and uh, to see if that chemical could be degraded. After uh, quite a bit of effort at designing an optimal system, we found that it would de that our little eco machine would degrade that chemical to in 72 hours from a dangerous level to below detectable limits. Mm. And that was the first time that it, uh, it, it, it was known that it's possible to degrade a very difficult chemical. So that doesn't explain the whole host of chemicals in frac water, but it does give me encouragement that someday uh, somebody will develop a ecologically engineered system um, to, to clean up at least many of it. And, uh, and, and I, I'm not an apologist for this approach to extracting petroleum products at all, uh, but I'm just saying since the damage has been done, it would be nice if we could... Um, you know, heal the contaminated groundwaters. Mm -hmm. And with all this success, why aren't eco machines um, all over the world right now? Is the cost prohibitive? Like, what's stopping us from employing this technology more uh, extensively? You've asked a very, a very difficult question that I really can't answer too well, but I'm going to try. Uh, first of all, um, there are over 120 eco machines around the world doing a good job. They are being adopted um, in terms of their economics. It's actually um, economically they com they outcompete conventional technologies both in terms of capital cost and in terms of operational cost. And I'm now beginning to wonder if that was their problem. They're so cost effective that. If you're an engineering firm, why build a million dollar project when you can build a five million dollar project? You know, mm -hmm. um, so that's one side of it. Um, and they're beautiful, so they should be everywhere. Uh, I think the I think it's changing slowly, but initially, I don't think people trust nature in the way I do. I think they're suspicious of any system that's filled with thousands of Easter lilies and doesn't stink and uh, looks beautiful. There's got to be something wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not noisy. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not noisy. Um, There's no flashing lights. <laughs> oh, I, re I really think that but I, I also think that's changing. For example, going back to Omega, and I have lots of other examples, a group of Native American elders were meeting in the facility, and they turned to um, Skip Backus, the, uh, the director, and said, this is a healing space. You know, there was the sound of the flowing water and the... The, the life surrounding everything. And uh, to them, that's what it was. So um, interesting. Yes. And that's one thing I did notice um, looking at videos of your eco machines is you've really merged function and beauty. Mm -hmm. And that is such a wonderful um, thing to I, have done. I'm, I'm trying to work on that all the time. For example, right now, uh, for helping to heal ponds and lakes. Um, trying years ago, when we were first started in the business of trying to uh, bring ponds back to health, we used uh, little floating windmills. They were, they were vertical, 
and they, they floated and they would spin around and even in quite gentle breezes and they were connected to a little paddle that was off the bottom of the pond and water would circulate so it wouldn't be dormant. And uh, they worked very well. I mean, they weren't the answer to everything, but they worked really very well. And it's just been in the last month or two that I've begun to think, I want a beautiful windmill um, that, that will circulate and aerate ponds and bodies of water and just look gorgeous. And, uh, and just the other day, I found it. Now I have to, I found the design. Now I have to find the, the group of people or the person to build it so that, um, but they're, they're like, they're, they're like sails on a merry-go-round on the water. And they're just wonderful celebration of the gentle power in most winds. So imagination has really played a key role in your design work. Yeah, yes, I think some of my engineering associates would say too damn much. <laughs> Oh, and you know, you have been working very closely with your wife, Nancy um, Jack Todd, for many years. And yeah. how has how has working with your wife um, in your work and also your life influenced your design work? Um, well, uh, first of all, she's she's a writer and 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 has written a number of books um, about our work and. Uh, and through her publication, Annals of Earth, you know, she, she presents to the world the kind of work we're doing on an ongoing basis. And but I, I think that one of the, 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 the biggest ways that she influenced the work from the very beginning was the, the, the social and the political dimension as well, you know. Are, is what we're doing the best thing for the most number of people in a given cer- set of circumstance? In other words, provide a a you know a very powerful ethical dimension, mm-hmm. and that goes that goes way back. So it it's a, it's very definitely a a a partnership in the best sense of the word. Mm. And we're we're getting close to the end of our time today. Um, is there anything else you would like to share with listeners about your work? I think the 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 one last thing I would like to end with is is I'm working on a um, a sailing ship right now. It's 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 a small ship, but it's it's a 132 feet, 134 feet long, and it's designed to. It's a two-hulled or catamaran ship. It has six masts. It's beautiful, and uh, and it's designed to sail through the water. And between the hulls are these uh, living technologies that takes contaminated seawater and would help to purify it. In other words, it's a it's a real ocean ark, and and the designs which uh, are the preliminary designs which are now completed uh, by a wonderful Canadian naval architect, Laurie McGowan. Um, it's also designed not only to clean millions of gallons a day of seawater, but to house lots of people who are studying the oceans while it's doing the work. In other words, there's quite a bit of accommodation and my dream is that there will be fleets of these ocean arcs that will be cleaning up our coastal waters and the oceans and the Great Lakes. And at the same time, we'll be educating people, young people particularly, but not just young people, about the power and the beauty of, and the mystery ultimately of the oceans. And it's kind of a floating, if you will, college of the oceans, which, uh, to which people who are concerned about the fate of the oceans could be part of the story. And uh, I, think, I think that, if, that um, it's, uh, it, it's symbolic of an age 
of sun and wind. Uh, so a, a, a really big shift in how we operate on the sea. And it's also a symbol of large scale um, protection of the ocean or expanding the scale of protection of the ocean. And, uh, and now I'm working on uh, the design of uh, uh, technologies, and these are not sail powered, to also um, protect coral reefs, which are being destroyed all over the world. And uh, these two will be very human friendly from an interactive point of view. Now all I've got to do is to raise the large amounts of money. The, the first ocean arc will be uh, cost us um, 25 million to build and to test the technologies. And that's a lot of money for... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for a professor. <laughs> a professor in a little uh, town of Woods Hole, an oceanographic community, but we got to, it's got to get done. And with your wonderful track record on the land, healing the water, the streams and fresh water, you're venturing out into the ocean. <laughs> I'm trying to. Mm, that's so I, wonderful. Go ahead. Well, I think at this age, at my age, I should mm -hmm. be a salty dog, yeah. don't you? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And then I know um, we have one minute, but I just wanted to close with one last question, because listening to you talk about what you've done and accomplished and helped the planet, and I always think of Paul Hawken, who said that the people that are really rising up and helping the Earth right now are the Earth's immune system. Yeah. So I think you're definitely a large, large part of that. You're the voice for the water. What if someone's listening, and I think it's easy for people to feel overwhelmed, like yeah. the environmental, it's too much, what can I do? Do you have any advice for people listening who really want to um, contribute to this great work of helping the earth and helping ourselves in the process? Um, yeah, I, uh, if, if you've got kids, it might be fun to build and design your own little eco machine for the the house the way my students did and uh, a bunch of my students um, created a little book a how to do it book and I just need to get that how to do it book up on our website so people can go get it and then go out and get started because it can be in your backyard or in a window or something like that and once you start becoming familiar with all these wonderful little organisms and creatures, um, your, your sense of where they might be useful just expands exponentially. So um, for starters, I guess, and I, what could happen is that people could email, email us for the student eco-machine book. And uh, we can at least get an electronic copy out to people. And if there's a, if it's an avalanche, um, I'll figure some way of dealing with the avalanche <laughs> by by getting it up on the, the web. That's great. Yes. So you can start at home. Yeah. And uh, and from there on, I mean, you can start growing a, some fish to eat, and some tomatoes and lettuce and off you go. So where can people find you online? Um, well, there are several places, but one would be uh, Todd Ecological, all one word, dot com. And the other is our NGO, our nonprofit, which is Ocean Arcs International. And that is OceanArcsInt, I-N-T dot org. Thank you so much, um, John Todd, for today. It's been fabulous talking with you. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. And good luck to you. Thank you. You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. You can find us online at sustainableworldradio.com and also on iTunes. For more information about permaculture and ecology, visit the Sustainable World Media YouTube channel, where you'll find videos about permaculture, aquaponics, organic gardening, rainwater harvesting, and much, much more. 
Sustainable World Radio is a listener-supported program. If you like what we do, please consider making a donation to the show. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier, and thank you so much for listening. Mm-hmm.